Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Covenant Cast. I'm Zach. And I'm Stephen. And I'm Paige. And I'm Patrick. And we are joined again by some very special guests, some retailers here at Gamma 2019 to discuss the state of retail in 2019. So stay tuned. It's going to be a good one. Let's, uh, let's kick this off. Uh, we have some guests here. We're at Gamma 2019. And if you guys could, just tell me your names and then the name of your store, where it's located, and a little bit about, about your, your kind of industry pathway here. Cool. Uh, my name is Patrick. Uh, I own, I'm one of the partners, one of the owners of Uncle's Games. We have four stores in Washington State. Two of them are in the Seattle area, so on the west side of the state, and two are in the Spokane area on the east side of the state. <laughs> Uh, and so one of the cool things I think about us is all four stores cater to a pretty different demographic. Okay, so it's not um, just like rinse and repeat. It is not, like, which can be hard for ordering the correct product because <laughs> every store kind of needs its own mix. Huh. Uh, we've been around since 1978, so we're one of the oldest game stores in the country. We are the oldest game store in Washington State. Um, and so we've seen the trends, like we were around before Magic. I myself have only been in the company for about eight years now. Um, and so I've been, yeah, in the industry for about eight years. I had always planned to open my own game store. I had told uncles that I would come work for them for like a year, learn the game industry, and then leave and go open my own store. And they said, hey, why not come on as a partner and eventual owner? So that's basically was my pathway into the industry. And yeah, we hooked you in. Can you, can you tell me why Washington State is such a big mecca? So, yeah, so Wizards of the Coast is in Seattle. And also, it used to be that uh, Jordan Weissman owned WizKids, and WizKids was also in Seattle. And so those two companies, not only, they become a locus for a lot of game talent. Lots and lots of game designers will come out to Seattle, get their first job at even the most low-level position at Wizards of the Coast, and it used to be also WizKids. And they would kind of work their way through the ranks or just leave and then start their own publisher. And so because of that, there's just a lot of publishers in that area that are really just ex-Wizards of the Coast and ex-WizKids employees. Okay, that uh, makes sense. I mean, and then those publishers have then inspired more publishers. So for example, one of my stores has a game designer night every other week, and some of the biggest names in the industry are all kind of hunkered down, hiding, playtesting games. Um, it's just because it's Seattle. And, and if you're interested in getting into the game industry, then it's a good place to be, because you will quickly connect with the people you need to connect yeah. with. Yeah, so, cool. makes sense. Paige? Well, you, Paige? well uh, my name's Paige, and my husband Xander and I opened Just Games Lexington in Lexington, Virginia, uh, six months ago. Wow. Um, <laughs> prior to that, we were in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was an accountant, didn't quite like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't envy those jobs. <laughs> um, and I am uh, working, still working on getting my degree from the University of Maryland. Uh, and I, I just had mentioned that I actually got into more board games while living in College Park, going to a board game cafe. Um, and just all my friends play board games, you know. it's. We, we would drive to Richmond every other month and our friends would drive up to us so we could play several months of Pandemic Legacy. And mm. you know we, it connected us and I liked um, that experience. And Xander got into magic when he was in grad school in Winston-Salem, started going, his, one of his friends that he made played a lot, got him hooked. It happens. In yeah, the best <laughs> like overnight, all of a sudden, yeah. all of magic, magic, magic. Yes, yeah, it's the only thing in the world at that point. Um, so, and again, he, he, we both grew up playing board games with our families. Uh, we heard about an opportunity to compete for a portion of a grant that the Commonwealth of Virginia was giving to towns, small cities and towns in Virginia, to foster small businesses on Main Streets and. Mm. We, we saw that opportunity and said, uh, let's do it. Let's try and get some of that. Uh, you take a class. Uh, you do a pitch competition. We ended up winning $10,000, which was wow. great and very validating. So like, it was four winners out of you know, maybe 15 people started the, in the competition. Um, 
and it took a while to find a space it, to open the problem with a small town is you know there were some vacancies but there's a lot of requirements for what your space needs to open a game store bathrooms being the big one I mean we so it's a historic town uh, a lot of old buildings a lot of That's buildings kind of cool. that have one itty bitty bathroom and weird pipes. So if you want to add a second one, or maybe, then good luck. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, I don't want to spend the entire ten thousand <laughs> adding another bathroom. You know, because there's not only do we want to offer good facilities, but then there are requirements to say if you have mm -hmm. more than fifteen people in attendance, which you know is for more than several hours, you are required by law to have more than one bathroom, which yeah. is which makes sense, like people need to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it took mm -hmm. months to find a place. Um, we have fi finally did open, and things have been going well, and here we Good. are. <laughs> How long was the find a space, open your door process? I would say it was about a month. Wow, um, that was fast. Well, <laughs> so we... We, <laughs> we tried, we That's looked awesome. at, yeah, so... We've been looking for spaces, and then a, a, an opportunity uh, came up in a very large building that was previously, most recently, an indoor mini golf course. I think it was 3,500 square feet in this this old, you know, it used to be an old library, if that gives you a sense of what this building looks like. Yeah. Um, and that didn't that that business didn't work out. Uh, the landlord is local and want, wanted something to be successful. We went in with a bike shop and a fitness studio. So we were gonna put we put up walls. We subdivided the space because really there was just no tenant that in this One town that was gonna yeah. yeah. Um, so we all worked together. Us, the owners of the other businesses, the landlord, his dad. <laughs> we're all in were, there. Were any of the other businesses grant winners, or was it just they totally random? They competed in the competition. They did not win grants, but chose to continue anyway, and they've, wow. they've also been doing well. I was going to say, well, the, the idea that three businesses are all opening in a small town at the same time. Seven businesses, I want to say seven, seven or eight businesses have opened in Lexington. Wow. And this is a tiny college town in rural Virginia. Wow. Opened it, opened in the last uh, year because so the of grants this. are working. Yeah, I want to say so. I mean, it's really, even if they didn't win, like going through that process, um, networking with other existing business owners, morally supporting each other through our trials. Um, that helps. Yeah. It certainly <laughs> helps. Um, do you, so given that you were kind of, I would say, I guess, onboarded in the least uh, romantic way into board games through a cafe model, it sounds like you didn't take that route for your own store. Like you didn't go the game cafe route. We have no experience in the food. We have no retail experience, but we also <laughs> have no experience with food. Okay. Um, we didn't, ha I mean, and that's a quite a lot more of an investment. It's a tremendous investment, yeah. yeah. And so the thing that Zach and I always go back to when people talk about like adding food, the people who I talk to who run restaurants the one thing they'll tell you is, for the love of God, never open a restaurant. Yeah. They're like, this is the hardest business on earth. So when we're like, right. ah, you know, should we or should we not? A lot of that is, is remembering those mm -hmm. lessons of mm -hmm. food is hard. Yeah. You know? I mean, we'd love to add coffee. You mm -hmm. know, we'd love to add small. Uh, we, we do have snacks. You know, we have sodas and drinks and, and snacks and candy. Yeah. But um I don't think we'd ever go the full like cooked to order route. That oh gosh, that just sounds yeah weird. right. <laughs> just get your grills going. It sounds terrifying. So it sounds like uh, I feel like your your story is not that dissimilar from a lot of people who dream the same dream. But it sounds like you know your husband was an accountant and wasn't loving that. You're in school um, and you took this opportunity to do something you were very passionate about. So like. As a new store opening in, I guess, 2018, you guys opened, mm -hmm. what was the official opening? September open date? 5th, so it literally was just our six month anniversary. And then now you're at Gamma. Gamma. Yeah. Uh, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. So what's the, I mean, as a new store, like what's the, is there an end game? Is it, is it you just wanna have a successful store and this is what you do? Or like, what's the, what's the, what's the reasoning behind it? Well, yeah, I mean, we are, are much happier here doing this together than we were in DC, um, more fulfilling. Eventually, I am uh, going to hopefully finish my degree uh, and get a, a real job. <laughs> um, 
Xander would love to continue running this store, and he's very good at it. Um, and we we can make that work. You know, we cool. don't want. I don't. It would be a shame to move, and but if we did, we'd probably try to start a new store. Um, but with building a community, there's really like you don't get to bring that value with you when you move, um, unless you're moving down the street. <laughs> yes. Patrick, could you yeah. could you just give us some context as to what the early days for you were like at Uncle's? Okay. Because um, I think yes. it would be interesting to kind of know the difference between yes. all of our different kind of like how it all started, right? So I came in to the industry, I guess maybe about a year before what what I call like the tabletop age. So we all like Will Wheaton tabletop suddenly like that hit and that that isn't necessarily the only catalyst, but it was one of the many catalysts that seemed to happen at the same time. It's also it's a clear thing that happened when all these other things were happening. That's exactly right. So there were there were a bunch of things that all kind of happened around that year roughly. Uh, so I got the taste of kind of pre and post. Um, and the game industry I would say pre was a very small, intimate, everybody knew each other. Uh, really like if you needed something, you just got on the phone and made it happen sort of industry that was did not have in any way the framework or the infrastructure for the storm that was about to hit, mm -hmm. right? And so when that storm came, and that storm was a very good one for all of us retailers, when suddenly board gaming really blew up and really hit into the mass market. I kind of compare it to uh, when the Wii hit for you know Nintendo. There were suddenly all these people who did not consider themselves video gamers who were now yeah. playing video games. And that kind of happened for tabletop players around that time, where suddenly there were all these customers coming into the store for the first time uh, who had just never been interested in uh, heavier board games. Um, and so that was, I mean, that was a wave. Like it was, you just did the best you can. And I think we're still to this day dealing with that. Distributors, publishers, everybody's trying to figure out how can we make this work with such high demand. And a big change of that that I consider is just the fact that most co consumers of entertainment, the way that other entertainment industries work is whatever is new is the thing, yeah. right? And so, Everybody is talking about Captain Marvel right now because that's the new movie. Yeah. But in a week to two weeks from now, nobody will be talking about Captain Marvel, right? Um, and that is true for video games, that's true for comics, that's true for most entertainment industries. And so a lot of these consumers that showed up at that time, they were way more interested in what's the cool new thing because that's how they normally interact with anything that's entertaining to them, entertainment. Um, and the industry had lived on this idea of like, when I make a game, I want that game to be selling for the next five years. Um, and so what's interesting, I see a lot of uh, publishers almost like resentful of these like this new trend. And I'm like, no, 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 you, you always have to, you guys know running a retail store, you go to where the customers are. If the customers want the like new hot thing, then, then we as an industry need to shift to cater to that yeah. audience. Um, and so I think that's one of the big changes. Like now you go into any board game store and there's a new releases section. And that seems really obvious. And yet, <laughs> you know, it wasn't. It right? wasn't. There was a time when it was not obvious. Uh, and you have customers who come in and they say, what's the new thing that came in this week? That was a thing that did not happen eight years ago, right? Yeah. And they don't even necessarily care what the game is. They, you say, these are the games that came in and they're gonna pick one to two of those, take them home, and you see them again a week later. Wow. Um, yeah. And so that's a, yeah, that's that's a com complete shift, right, for the industry. And Uncle's has always played this interesting role because we're in malls, and so we are now catering to those customers, but we've always been a lot of people's first interaction into the industry in the first place because we're in a mall, so people are just walking in. So I still sell a metric ton of Catan <laughs> um, because, and every day, almost every day, somebody walks in my one of my stores and they have never heard of Catan. Yeah, yeah. it happens. And yeah. so I, I am still in that place of bringing new people. And so similar to what I described, say, with the Wii, like we're, we are still 
creating. Like if you look at the board game industry and the amount of consumers, it's tiny. It's yeah. tiny. And so we have like just scratched the surface and here we are like seven, six years later and we're still only scr scratch mm -hmm. the surface um, of what's ahead. So I don't know that totally answers your question, but. Yeah, well, do you think that a number of those people that, that come into the new releases is the long tail of tabletop games getting them interested in that back catalog? Because there is, I, I've certainly met a number of people who get brought in by the shininess. Yep. And then they're like, wait a minute, there is a giant there is. depth going on here. And now they're looking for the collector's edition mm -hmm. 1973. I find Puerto it. Yeah, right, the Puerto Rico, yeah, exactly. So if a customer comes in and says, I'm looking for this kind of game, um, then it is much easier to go into a back catalog. If a customer comes in and is like, I want the game that all my friends are talking about on Facebook, they want the game that all their friends yeah. are talking about on Facebook, and it doesn't matter what that back catalog is. And also back catalog is good in that, uh, the thing about games is that you will go over a friend's house and play that game. Um, and so a lot of back catalog stuff still sells just mm -hmm. because games sit on shelves forever. Like, I think we've all had the experience where somebody comes in looking for a game that hasn't been in print since the 70s, and they're like, but I just played it last week. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes, I understand that you played it last week, but they literally have not made that game in like 40 years. Uh, so um, yeah, that's just another uh, part of our industry, but that, that's probably the biggest shift is, I think it's, a, I, honestly, I think it's part of maturation. Like we didn't have street dates when I walked into the industry. Like it was so ridiculous coming yeah. from the video game industry and being like, I don't know when this is going to show up. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I, I remember early on, uh, one of the things we did first after opening like a, our local store was we got really big in LCGs, yeah. Latin card games. And I remember it would just be like, you the product shows up. I, yep. You see retailers posting on or player posting on Facebook. It's like, ah, oh, my retailer got it on Monday. I got yep. my pack, and it's like we don't have ours yet. There's a store. Yep. And I was like, this is, this is yeah. wild. I'm I used like, to, for LCGs, I would drive up to our distributor so I would have the packs before any other stores mm -hmm. in the area. Just so I could get ahead of, because there was no street date. So I'd be like, all right, I'm just going to drive up in the morning, grab them, bring them uh, down, and then all my LCG customers are going to walk in and all the other stores won't have it till tomorrow at least. So, yeah. yeah. Wow, but nice. it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, right? Like, yeah. that, that isn't necessarily how I wanted to compete, you know what I mean? Like sure, I'm more than willing sure. to compete in other ways. Um, and street dates are so potent because in any other industry, you, I mean, what do you see when you see a movie poster? The biggest thing is usually the date that it comes out, right? Yeah. And so for, for the industry, for us to be able to be like, if you show up on this day, X-Wing, we run midnight launches. You guys probably run midnight launches. Like for X-Wing, we have tons of people who show up at midnight to get X-Wing ships. You can't do that without street dates, right? Because you're like, yeah. I, uh, I don't know what it's going to show up. Yeah. Um, well, if it shows up at 5 p.m., why have it at midnight? Just right, like, exactly, exactly. So yeah. that's that's been one big thing that... I mean, imagine movie theaters. I mean, it's the same thing, right? <laughs> if I saw a local Cinemark post, oh, we got you know the new Avengers movie in two weeks early. Come and see it. It's like, it'd be madness. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> so, yeah. so here's, here's the question, though. I think... We have a great perspective here with you, Paige, having kind of entered this uh, this world relatively new. Um, so, especially Patrick, you've seen things evolve from where they used to be to where they are mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're coming in like right now, what are the challenges that are in front of you um, that maybe, you know, because maybe Street Dates isn't it. You, you haven't yeah. seen the growth, so it's kind of all new challenges. So what would you say are some of the things you've run into um, with this retail business that uh, maybe were unexpected or have been challenging to get through or surprising there's a lot of surprises <laughs> i mean i'm constantly surprised by just the the width of what we sell i mean we started when we started we're like all right well we should know pretty much about every game that we have we mm -hmm. should know what we could we should be able to say this is the, so we're not going to stock a ton of titles we're just going to you know, do our research and pick, we're going to curate and pick. And we have expanded, expanded, because people would come in like, oh, I really, I love this game. You should yeah. have this game. And we were like, okay, we're going to listen. And mm -hmm. every time we listen, it's good, because they say, I love this game. And people come in like, oh, you have this. I'm like, yeah, so-and-so recommended it. <laughs> um, and being able to say like, yeah, this, you know, these, these guys who love board games said this is great. And so I haven't played it yet, but, you know, I can, they can vouch for it. Mm -hmm. 
um, because like you can't play. We haven't played 300 games, right. 400 games. <laughs> Um, no one expects us to be able to say exactly how to play every game in our store. Absolutely. But I, I have a reason why everyone is on this shelf. Mm -hmm. um, so just, you know, picking that collection. And another challenge is, um, you know, I, I love board games. Xander likes board games. He loves magic. Uh, didn't know. I, I'd heard of D&D, obviously. Yeah. Never played it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, never played any miniatures games. Had no clue how what Warhammer even was. Um, <laughs> You've got to so, put them together and paint them. It's yeah. the crazy. It's like, so, you take them off yeah. and like, black <laughs> I was nervous. I was like, okay, I guess we should stock D&D. Let's just start with a little bit. Okay, let's get a lot more because it's actually... <laughs> and then getting, you know, one of our customers invited us to join... A group that she was going to DM, and she, it was her first time doing it, and a lot of us were new except one guy. So I actually started playing D and D. I was like, okay, that's why it's so fun. This is why you want a whole bunch of accessories for it. That's right. This, okay, so now I'm like understanding more. I mean, I still haven't played Warhammer, <laughs> so you, to, learning about that's products that yeah. I understand <laughs> people love and that are perennial like uh, bestsellers or they're hot right now. But if I don't, if I haven't played it and I don't understand it, it's hard sometimes. So I sort of just like tell my customers like, hey, I know you guys here, like you love Warhammer and the figures that you paint are beautiful. And you know that we're, this is not really our area. So like, I'm gonna need you to help us. Tell mm -hmm. us what kind of events you wanna see. Tell us how to like, you know, build up this community. Um, so making our, our customers our partners in a way like because they want their their game of choice to be successful so they have yeah. other people to play with and that you know yeah can I, can I also answer your question Stephen yes bit? even um, though from a absolutely because one of my concerns actually right now in the industry is related to new stores so I, I'm really excited that you've started mm -hmm. your store because it kind of makes everything I'm about to say wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> um, you want to be wrong. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I want to be wrong. Uh, one of the beauties I love about the industry is we all have different stories of like the dream and then executing that dream. One of the things I'm noticing from a lot of the publishers at Gamma is in publisher group or publisher meeting after publisher meeting, they're starting to stratify stores into these groups of like, a lot of them are using like the silver, gold, platinum mm -hmm. system, but they were like tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, and I understand why they're doing that, but it's always like based on, you know, sales and how much you're ordering for me. And one of my concerns is that if all these established stores that are at like the platinum level or whatever are getting all these perks mm -hmm. and all of these stores that down at the silver level aren't getting those perks, is it going to become increasingly hard for somebody who has a very good idea and a very good dream and a very good head to start a business getting into the industry just because there's these other people that already have this advantage so I kind of, I almost wish that with those tiers, maybe there was like a, a one year or something, some sort of system. I like totally agree. If you're a brand mm -hmm. new store yeah. for a year, we're, we're going to support you like you're a platinum yeah. or whatever <laughs> and help you get established. And then you're going to have to, you know, deal well, with everything else. I, I almost feel like the, the, pro the only problem there is that the key metric is wrong, yep. which is if it's based on volume, right? Yep. A store that's been around for 15 years and has an extra discount yep. is like, more likely to be successful yeah. than yep. the six month so store. Loop so there. like the thing to me is if you were measuring other things, yep. right? Well, yeah, what is the key metric? Is it players create? Can you measure players created? Cause that's oh. really the value that publishers are seeing in the local environment, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, right now you can't measure it. But the, the problem is that like the, the easiest thing to measure right now is volume cause you already have that data. Mm -hmm. But almost any time you get into like deep analytics, it's like you have to decide what's important to measure. And then the next step is, well, how do we even measure that? Right. Yeah. Um, and that, the real question there is like, you know, the various publishers are the ones determining these tiers and the benefits that you get of the tiers and stuff. So what is it that a store can do that they value? And it's literally just push volume. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the new 1500 square foot random store in a small college town right. is like unlikely to stand up to, like we talked to Travis yesterday, he's got 10,000 square feet and he's had a store for 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. And it's like, He's probably pushing a little more volume. Yeah, it's like if, if the only metric we're looking at for the support level is volume, this is 
Mm -hmm. And I struggle with that too in that just because I have four stores and they're not at the scale of say Millennium or something, uh, mostly because we're in malls, right? Square footage is expensive. Um, and yet sometimes depending on the publisher, they might look at those four stores and say, you run a smaller business than this one store that is bigger, but is actually making way less money than we are, but we're just yeah. across multiple locations. So that's, a, I mean, that's, that's personal just to me, but I do also notice like this year at Gamma, especially it is very, you know, eight years ago, it was very uncommon. We were one of the few places that had like four stores, right? Yeah. And here we are eight years later, it's not uncommon now for me to be talking to owners who have three or four locations or more. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that that's another way the industry hasn't quite caught up um, in a lot of ways. Like even just pre-ordering and stuff is just not designed for multi-location sure. site. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and it's also like just the reality of if, if volume is the only thing that matters, mm -hmm. the industry is going to look a lot different than if creating new players, building communities, even the reality of like, yeah. I would think as a publisher, if let's say your store page is the only store within a hundred miles doing anything for insert the game here, mm -hmm. right. that they would, that's way more critical mm -hmm. than the town that has 15 stores. Absolutely. And it's like, they may be bigger, they may have more players, mm -hmm. but it's like, I, I would almost think they would want their system to identify that lone store. And it's like, this is the only place within two hours that anybody can buy GW or Magic or Pokemon or yeah. Fantasy Flight or whatever, it doesn't matter. But like, you know, their systems are gonna to need to adapt to that. I, I agree, I think it is right now, it's a challenge to get yeah. in. Yeah. It, it does seem like that side of the business is the one that needs to develop next. We talk about how we've seen a lot of growth in various things like pre-orders and street dates mm -hmm. slowly getting better. And even having a tiered system is like an example mm -hmm. of the way things have changed. It's a know, system. Over the years. It's a system. So yeah, it's now the system can get better. <laughs> yeah. But I do get the sense that, especially on the publisher level, having the essentially the capital to invest in systems that don't make you money back right now like the, the analytics and the measurements and being like clear communication channels with all of your stores and partners and like having those systems developed and easy to use, like investing all of that cash in mm -hmm. information is like, I feel like the next thing that needs to happen. And, and I know that those margins are hard to make that work, but I do think that the people that do end up going that direction are probably going to be the next five to 10 year, you know, success stories. Yeah. Well, that's that's just like a much bigger bet, right? It's like it's not a let's do this promotion that'll increase pack sales now. Right. It's like we're gonna get better at identifying the stores that need our support and offer them more support. Uh, like it, it's a, it's a very long tail <laughs> process. Well, as much as you know, Wizards is getting flack right now for uh, changes. You know, changes people get nervous. I don't like their metrics of engaged players. I mean, obviously they can easily measure all this because we have to report every event, but they're, they're looking at engaged players and activated players, so they are looking at things that I think matter. Sure. Are you teaching new people this game? And how good are you at, at effectively doing so that, they, so that they want to come back to your store? Now, I know it's a lot, it's gonna be a lot harder to do that for like a board game publisher because um, how do you know that like we're demoing your games and not someone else's mm -hmm. games? How can you incentivize us to do so? Like, yeah, I love your games, but you know, if you're selling, if somehow you're allowing them to be sold on Amazon for such a big discount, like, how are you supporting retailers? Like, sure. where if, if I like two games equally, all else equal, if one is being sold on a discount on Amazon, I'm not going to get a demo copy of that game. I'm going to get a demo copy of the game that sure. is supported in our store by not being undercut online. And I think that's a challenge, especially with board game publishers, because a lot of them aren't giant companies that can, you know, do all these things. And so like, they're just trying to produce a product and get it into as many hands as possible. But like, ultimately the truth is, the games that are most appealing for retailers to build communities around and sell and be sustainable are the ones that are gonna get the support in the long run. But I do think, I, I, I saw, I know Wizards are making a lot of changes right now. Um, and they seem to be constantly improving. We, we don't we don't do magic, um, mm -hmm. so like we, we have very little like uh, <laughs> people talk about it and you hear it, but yeah. like it, just yeah. very little context. But it does seem like um, I happened to I got an email this morning uh, from them about the changes to their tier system actually right. that I didn't really look at. I don't know if you guys have yeah, scoped it out it. yet or not. Yep. 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 Uh, but essentially, they were saying one of the problems is that 
their support didn't scale appropriately, or mm -hmm. it was like a, a hundred person event was getting the same promos as a twenty person event, and obviously that's not uh, right. that's not great. So if they're measuring it, again, we don't really interact with wizards that much, but if they're measuring new player creation and player engagement and consistency of visits and stuff, I think it's a step in the right direction from yeah. a pretty major publisher. Yeah, it's definitely better than having the, the gates, kind of. And also, I wanted it related to what you just asked about, like, having these new ideas. That's one of the reasons I'm afraid of new stores getting locked out, is that's often where the new... Imagine if Team Covenant could have never gotten off the ground. You wouldn't be here, right? Pretty easy to imagine, actually. <laughs> so I, I just ago. mean that... A lot of times, it almost didn't. A lot of times... <laughs> Maybe we would, like if the hole in the wall stores that existed, mm -hmm. you know, 15 years ago, had a lock on the market, and everybody with a cafe model or whatever idea, just was never able to get into a level where they were able to make money with publishers. There are so many things that we, as an industry, even those of us who have been around for a long time, would be missing out on. And so I, I think that's one reason why it's important to me, even as an established retailer that there are new retailers able to come in, which sounds ridiculous, right? It's like competition, but often that's where new energy, new mm -hmm. ideas well, it's, comes in. I think so. it also ties back to another belief you were kind of somewhat stating earlier, which is that, you know, you feel like we just scratched the surface. There's, mm -hmm. if you look at, you know, just entertainment, you know, consumer bases, tabletop is still very small compared right. to video games or comics and down the line, right? right? Movies, et cetera. And so, you know, if you're thinking, and this is this is our view too. Like we have yeah. a long view on this, which is ICV two has numbers. I don't know how accurate they are, but yeah. last year they reported like total industry and in hobby channel sales was like one point five, one point six billion. Right. And it's like I think that number can be 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 really plus can. billion dollars. And so when you realize that, it's like yeah, there are four or five, six thousand stores in the U.S. right now. But like, yeah. if one point five billion turns into ten billion, yeah. there's going to need to be a lot more going on in the industry. We're not we're not in an industry where the the pie is filled and we're all mm -hmm. chopping up. The pie can definitely grow in our industry. Yeah. Like definitely grow. Potentially, I even see that. I can give a perfect example of that in that um, probably one of the most beloved stores in the industry, Mox Boarding House, is just down the street from one of my stores. Um, and they opened up after us. Um, and all that really did is it shifted me even further into gateway entry gamers and we just kept on doing what we were doing and it just meant that they're like very focused on um, you know like the cool hipster date night kind of crowd and I'm very focused on the family um, gateway uh, like I literally have a mom who drives a minivan around on Friday night picking up kids and drops them off for our Friday night magic <laughs> that's great. because that's the Friday and it, if those kids went to Mox it, it what it you know, it's all against mm -hmm. competitive players. It wouldn't be the right atmosphere for them. And those kids eventually like grow up and become hyper competitive and they move on to the more competitive stores, but that's fine. I'm constantly generating um, new gamers. And so that that's a perfect example of how you would think, oh, these two stores are not very, are not very far away. They must be like at loggerheads with each other. But actually we found that we have a pretty good relationship with them because we're catering to different markets nice. um, and they don't carry jigsaw and I carry a ton of jigsaw so they're always sending a ton of jigsaw right people over to my store you know and so it it's a it can it doesn't have to look like what people think it looks like yes yeah. so well I know you guys have a uh, something to get to here yeah. pretty quickly so let's if we could get just kind of the long view of uh, your guys each of your visions for where you want your store to be in the next five, even 10 years. Like, where where are you ultimately pointing uh, to go, right? Where do you wanna be? And how do you wanna to contribute to the industry as a whole? Patrick, I, I assume you might wanna start on a page. Feel free if you can take it, but uh, you know, you probably have- I wanna contribute. I think that we, and this is why things like this are really important to me. That's why meeting new game store owners is really important mm -hmm. to me. I think that we have a lot as much change as we've seen in the industry come before, I think we have a lot more change ahead. Uh, I think it's gonna be hard for people who aren't um, paying attention and working hard. And I also think that there is gonna be greater survivability in conversation with each other as store owners about different things that we're learning. So I guess for me, a thing that I always wanna do is uh, be talking with other store owners and even connecting store owners. I'm in a lot of like Facebook groups and stuff that we're, where it's just some key store owners where we can kind of discuss 
you know, how we're de dealing with different challenges. And I, I think that's kind of a place that I really enjoy. Um, one of the, even the fun things in the Seattle market is since I don't sell singles, kind of like you guys, you don't mm -hmm. sell magic. I sell magic, but I don't sell singles at all. It puts uncles in this interesting position where we can sometimes be a middle ground for a lot of the other stores. Um, and so just working together, rather than everybody kind of, you know, holding back our secrets, right? And being like, I got the thing that's gonna make me survive and everybody else is gonna die. Um, like that's really not my heart. I would much rather us all be kind of talking to each other and working together as an industry. And also one of the other unique places for me is that I have a lot of friends in the designer community, a lot of friends in the publisher community. I spend a lot of time looking at box art and telling them if it's bad or not and things like that, right? <laughs> That's um, the Lord's work. Again, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so also opening up those channels of communication. Like I was in a panel here at Gamma that was just all about forecasting issues because as you mentioned wingspan, like it's a huge issue in the industry. Uh, but if we're never talking to each other about what our concerns are, uh, I feel like there's a lot of stereotyping of the different yeah. tiers of the industry that is happening right now. And so any way that we can be opening up those channels of communication, that's that's my heart, I guess. For And how to solve those problems, right? Yeah, yeah I, let's I solve like them. And, and let's try things out. I'm, I'm never opposed. I even do this in my stores. It's like, let's try a thing. And if it doesn't work, okay, let's stop doing it and try a different thing. But that's a big part, too, is I feel like we don't beta test ideas enough, like yeah. distributors and publishers especially. And I think we should be trying to try things. And if it fails, it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. If you, if you did it for six months and it fails, scrap it and move on. And now so, you know. Absolutely. And now you know a lot more. What do you think, Paige? I think in, this is much smaller scale. <laughs> in, in five years, I'd, I'd love for in our local community for everyone to just know that there's a game store, just like everyone just knows that there's a coffee shop. Everyone just knows that, like, and on a broader scale, culturally, if that happens so that, you know, if you move or you go to somewhere new and you just know that you can look up the local game store just yeah. like you could look, just like every town has a coffee shop. Every town has a, lo you know, a local game store. And there's just that knowledge that you can go ahead and look them up. Some people already know that, you mm -hmm. know, we have, um, like I said, we have a lot of colleges in the immediate vicinity. Uh, so some people say, yeah, I moved here and I looked up Lexington Game Store. Yeah. And there we are. So yeah. if that becomes a cultural um, thing, just like you, you can look up the local movie theater, mm -hmm. then I think that's great for business that's and absolutely for building a community that's, i think that's just great for uh, yeah. the whole world <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly I think it's great for exactly people we, yes. Yes. we've often talked about how it, the potential for the local game store to be the new community hub mm -hmm. for totally entire agree. communities is there i mean it's not going to be the bar it's not going to be the restaurant mm -hmm. but like this is a place dedicated to people sitting across from each other having a good time and getting to know each other, having conversations, meeting each other. Mm -hmm. It's a very unique, we, we find every day that it's it's more special than even we thought it was, I think, to begin with. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that continues to happen for all of yeah. you as well and we can we can move in that direction. And also I haven't played Warhammer either, so. <laughs> <laughs> me, me neither, I feel too bad yeah. about that. Good, good <laughs> I saw that as a kid, I was like, nope. Yeah, I certainly <laughs> admire the painting, oh my gosh. Oh, it's I have painted, but I haven't yeah. ever played this <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. All right, I think we've done it. Uh, shall we uh, get out of here? Zach, you want to take us out? You guys have anything uh, left to add? Anything else you'd Thanks like to say about us? Thanks for having us. It was great. Absolutely. Thank Sorry you. we had Thanks to, coming on. to yeah. cut it a little short, yeah. but maybe next gamma we can uh, do a deep dive yeah. and, uh, and see where the industry's yeah. going to be in the next 20 yeah. years. All right, everybody. <laughs> stay tuned. We have plenty more coming from Gamma 2019. Thank you so much for watching and or listening, and thank the two of you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Paige. Thanks, Patrick. Look forward to catching up with you again in the future. Until next time, keep playing.